um, it was like going to not be maxing me out. I was going to be paying an amount that I felt pretty comfortable with, but it was a push. And so it was like beyond this, if I'm paying any more, it's going to start to hurt. And so that's where I was also uncomfortable. And my mom always told me she's a very wise woman. Like you do not want to be house poor. Like you don't want all your money just going into your house and that's all, all you can afford. Welcome to the Teacher Money Show, the podcast dedicated to helping teachers navigate your unique financial challenges and unlock your financial superpowers. I'm your host, Sean Morgan, a full-time teacher. That's right, I teach every day just like you and personal financial coach. And I'm here to help every teacher, whether you are a seasoned teacher looking for fresh insights or a new educator navigating your first paycheck to have a richer wallet, classroom, and life. The contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice, and neither I nor my guests are engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should not act upon this information without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. I am super excited to have Bree Lee on the podcast today. Bree is the mind behind at ritual underscore finance. The underscore is important on Instagram. And she is a California teacher focused on uh, California teachers uh, and their finances. She's a 31-year-old high school math teacher living in the Bay Area in her ninth year of teaching. She's always been pretty responsible with her money, but started getting more into personal finance during the COVID lockdown when she had more time on her hands. Outside of work and ritual finance, she enjoys reading, binging a show on Netflix, doing yoga, relaxing, and spending time with family. Bree, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. So I stumbled upon Bree's account because I always just like, you know, looking through various things and Whenever I stumble on a new account, I, I look through and see what piques my interest. And something that particularly piqued my interest uh, when I got onto your account was that you are choosing to rent instead of buy. So how did you come to make that decision? Because a lot of traditional advice talks about the importance of buying for your long-term financial health, but you think that renting is better in this case. Yeah, for sure. So growing up, I always, you know, thought buying was going to be the way to go. You, you know, like my parents were able to buy. Um, times were obviously different. And I just feel like that's like the wisdom that's shared with you when, you, when you're growing up. Um, so I, I rented for a year after college with some roommates, and then I decided to move back home. Um, which was a hard decision because I have a lot of pride and I did not want to move back home, but I did. And I lived with my dad for, I think it was probably about five years. Um, and so while I was there, I was able to save a lot of money thinking that, you know, one day maybe I'd be able to buy something. Um, and so dur I think it was in 2021, interest rates were like really low, like unheard of. And my mom said, May, like, have you thought about buying? Cause I, I was telling her I was ready to move out of my dad's house. Um, they're separated. So I was having this conversation with her while I was still living at my dad's. And, and I said, no, there is absolutely no way I can afford to live, like to buy in the Bay area. Um, and she's like, well, just look, who knows? So I did start looking and, um, doing some more digging and I, I could have afforded, um, a small one bedroom condo, which I would be paying around $500,000 for. And it wasn't going to be anything nice. Like, you know, it, it's decent. It's good, but it's not anything fancy. Um, no bells and whistles, just like kind of a bare bones, like decent home to live in. Um, but I knew that a one bedroom apartment wasn't my long-term goal, right? I'm not going to want to live in this for the rest of my life. I don't know if I want to have kids, but I know it's not my forever home. Um, and so after like running lots of numbers and thinking a lot about it, I, I realized that financially I was actually better off renting. Okay. So I just, I have to tell you, and I, I'm sure that you hear this living in the Bay area area, but, um, where I live, which is middle of nowhere, Texas, you could get a McMansion for five hundred, <laughs> right? Like the biggest houses in my town. I mean, like there's some like big like ranches and things like that that are you know million dollars, two million dollars. But like a gigantic four hundred square foot house, multiple bedrooms, multiple bathrooms with a huge yard, five hundred thousand dollars. 
no sweat. Yeah, it's <laughs> insane. I know it is so crazy. I, I and so I have considered like purchasing elsewhere as a rental property, but for um in terms of like living in my primary residence, it's just not not the way to go. And so what I ended up doing instead was taking all of that money that I had saved up, and not all of it, but a good chunk of it. And I started investing more heavily. And so I'm still, I still have an investment, but the investment is not in a home. Right. No, I, I want to get into that investment piece, but I'm just pointing out that right now we're talking about situation specific things, right? So being able to buy a half a million dollar condo in the Bay Area versus being able to buy, you know, a starter home that's around $100,000 somewhere else, it might make more sense to buy in that situation while it might make more sense to rent in the Bay Area. So it really is situation specific. Uh, so we're talking about when it is better to rent versus buying. And we won't really be able to give advice that's going to be for you to be like, oh yeah, you should definitely buy. You know, we'll, we'll give you ways to think through this as we're talking about this and the way that you thought through this decision. Um, so I, I want to actually circle back around to what you did with the extra money with the investing probably at, at the end. Um, but the thing that caught my uh, eye when uh, I was looking at, at your uh, account was that you had this way that you can make this decision, these questions you should ask yourself. Uh, so I just wanted to go through these. I'll, I'll, I'll say them out loud and then we'll go through them one at a time. Why you think that's an important question, why you use that question in your decision to, to rent or buy. Uh, so the questions are, how long do I plan to live here? What are the housing market conditions in my area? Can I comfortably afford unexpected housing maintenance costs? How much will I pay in insurance, taxes, interest, and HOA fees? And how does the rent compare to the total of all of that? So let's start with the first one. Why is how long do I plan to live here? Uh, an important factor when you're considering renting or buying? So I, I think that this is probably more important if you are having to like take out a mortgage. Um, but so in my situation, thinking about if I know that this isn't going to be my long-term home in the maybe three to five years that I might be living there, I'm probably going to barely pay down the principal. I'm mostly going to be paying um, interest and whatever else in those first few years. And so then when I think about going to sell in a short amount of time, the house will likely not have appreciated that much. And so um, when I end up selling after all the fees that come with selling, and the fact that I didn't pay down the principal very much, I'm not really going to be netting any money. Um, and in fact, I might end up losing money. Um, and and you don't know what the, the market's going to be like a few years from now. Versus if you know you're going to be there long term, chances are it is going to appreciate and value quite a bit over that longer chunk of time. Right. Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know how mortgages work, they front load your interest hardcore. So every time they say, hey, the interest rate went down a quarter point, you should totally refinance. They just want you to restart your interest. So that way you're paying only interest instead of like any principal at all. Uh, so there are ways that they're making their money, even if you aren't going to be there for, you know, 30 years for, for you to pay down the mortgage. They're, they're making most of their money up front in those first five to 10 years. Um, so, I mean, I, I've, I've felt this, that what you're talking about. I have bought saying, I'm going to live here for, you know, this long. I mean, I, this, my long-term goal is to live here. And then circumstances changed and I moved twice. <laughs> That's happened to me. <laughs> so like, uh, even when you think you're going to be there long-term, sometimes life throws a curveball at you and you need to consider that if you are not like really rooted in an area, uh, living in, in a, a bot, like a, a house that you're buying with a mortgage, it might not really be the, the best option if you could potentially move in the near future. Cause you're, because of what you're talking about, the, those fees, like I, when I'm thinking of buying and selling a house, cause I do some real estate on the side, uh, I think like 10% of the total sale price is what you're going to be paying. You might pay a little bit less than that, but not much. So like, that's a big chunk of change, especially yeah. on like a half a million dollar home. They're talking about you know 50 grand that you have to make sure that you've padded in your pay down and your appreciation before you start making any money after selling it. It's, it's a quite significant. Yeah. And I like, that's something I never realized until I like started really 
digging deeper and learning more. Um, and just another like note is here I am several years later, still living in the Bay. Like I haven't moved, nothing's changed, but um, I have this like fear that what it, like something is going to change. Like what if I decide suddenly I don't want to live here um, that the, the like freedom that comes with renting and not being stressed about owning a home and what I'm going to do with it also just gives me more peace of mind. Yeah. I, you know, your peace of mind really makes a big difference. Like we, we, we talk about numbers and, and the dollar value and, you know, how much money you'll lose if you buy and sell, but really if you have more peace of mind renting versus uh, owning that, that can make huge difference in quality of life versus uh, just the, the number difference that it can make. Mm -hmm. So you, you brought up the housing market conditions in your area. You're asking, what are they now? Or are you asking, what are they going to be, you think, later? Or is it a bit of both? Like, what what, what is that question about? I think kind of both. So, like, um, in the, you're right, there might be, like, a lot of competition at a certain time. It's driving prices up or whatever it may be. There's something going on currently. Um, but then also thinking about, like, how are things going to change in the future? So some areas are growing more rapidly than others. And so I just think like, if you know you're buying in an area that is going to be growing rapidly, you might be able to see more appreciation than, than somewhere else. So I think kind of a mixture of both looking at current and future. And the future is of course unknown, but maybe you can, you know, maybe you can kind of see trends of where things are headed. It is unlikely that the Bay Area will suddenly become depopulated and your values will drop, you know, drastically. But you, you never know, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then, like, if you're in a town that's kind of stagnant, being aware of that. And then um, something else I think is important to know, there's there's a buyer's market and a seller's market. At this moment, we are, we are in a buyer's market. Uh, like, you know, a few years ago, like you put it on the market, it was gone the next day. That That's the seller's market. But now it's going on the market and it's sitting for one month, two months, three months. There's lots of inventory. So if you're buying, you can negotiate more, right? In a buyer's market, it might be better for you to buy if that's your situation, because you can bring the price down in negotiation. You can ask for concessions. You can get things from the seller who is trying to sell the home. While in, in the seller's market, they might feel like, oh, this is the time, you know, everything's going up and it's so great, but you won't be able to get as much or you might not get what you want when you're buying a home. So just being aware of, of the, the time that we're in nationally, but also in your local market, because some places are just always going to be more of a, a seller's market uh, just because they're really desirable areas. So just keeping that in mind. Um, you, you've talked about these different uh, the last three are really about the different like sub costs that we don't think of when you're you're buying a house. Uh, so when you're talking about maintenance costs, what, what do you mean? So like perhaps you're going to need a new roof um, and that's going to cost you. I don't even know. ten thousand. I don't even know how much a new roof costs, but I know it's expensive because my dad needed one recently and was like, oh, we got to get out of here. Um, so just like. God, when you're a renter, you're not responsible for all the things that go wrong. Um, but when you are a homeowner, you are responsible. And so your emergency fund really, I think, needs to be bigger than it would be for someone who is not a homeowner, um, because you just never know what's going to come up. I feel like their homeowners are always dealing with something. It seems at least maybe my family has bad luck. But like my mom, like there's just always something, there's a plumbing issue, there's a this issue, the house needs this. Um, and so some of those costs are expected, right? But then sometimes something is unexpected and you don't want to be put in a bad situation because you can't afford it and you have to like go into more debt or whatever it may be. Um, and so like when I was thinking about my my journey and how much I was going to be paying. Um, it was like going to not be maxing me out. I was going to be paying an amount that I felt pretty comfortable with, but it was a push. And so it was like, beyond this, if I'm paying any more, it's going to start to hurt. And so that's where I was also uncomfortable. And my mom always 
told me she's a very wise woman. Like you do not want to be house poor. Like you don't want all your money just going into your house and that's all, all you can afford. Yeah. My, the first house that I bought, I was also paid very poorly. Um, I, I realized that I had my, you know, my regular, you know, food and, and, you know, other basic utilities bills and all that stuff uh, for living in a place. And then I had a Home Depot section of my budget where I was just like, I, you know, I was just, there's things that need to be fixed here and there. And, and I was trying to improve the property. I wanted it to be nicer. So like when you own the house, you tend to want to, to fix it up and make it a, a nicer and nicer. Um, and you, you really can't do that when you're renting. Like you, your mm -hmm. landlord doesn't want you to mess with their house. <laughs> so um, that temptation is not really there. Uh, I mean, and also I have a water heater that like the pilot light just goes out every day and I have to turn it back on every day. And if I was renting, I would have called my landlord by now and said, fix this. Yes. Own. I'm just like, I'll get to it eventually. And I just keep turning the pilot light back on. So, you know, there are those maintenance costs, those little things that, that do add up. And it depends on if that's, if you want to be putting money into a house and making it nice and making it yours, or if you want to have somebody else handle it. Um, you know, we have that, that, that rent cost does include that like a good landlord is going to have money set aside in their budget of this is how much I'm going to be spending on maintenance costs and that's included in how much they're charging you for rent if they are doing what they're supposed to do and having a good investment so it's not like you're not paying these things but if you're paying like a you're just like small amount in your rent every single month that's just like a normal bill that you can afford when the roof comes up that's not coming out of your pocket additionally right it's just something that's been getting paid as part of your rent over over time and, and the tenants before you right if you've been mm -hmm. there for a year the roof goes out it's the tenants before you that paid for the roof going out not you so uh it's not like it's just like free ride on, on those big problems but you're not paying them as they come up yeah and i thought i like your point about like when you own something you're like you are tempted like I want to change this. I want to do this. There's all these places that you're tempted to spend money. At least I know I would be. Even when I was just touring properties, I'm like, well, eventually I would really want to do this, but I, I knew I wouldn't be able to afford that for several years down the road. So and then I'd just be sitting there staring at it, like wondering when I would get to it. It's it's, it's a real problem. There's always another project I could do. There's so, so many projects. Uh, I also enjoy doing the projects. That's like one mm -hmm. of these basically. So it's like, I could be spending money on any number of other hobbies or I spend money on my house, but still it, it depends on what you want to do. If, if you are not someone who likes to putter around and, and do things at your house and you're going to pay somebody to do it, it gets really expensive really fast. Yeah. And if you're handy and you like to like do some DIY projects, I, I think that it could be so fun. Um, I'm not. I'm not that person. So, you know what? I'm, I'm the, the handy one, but if you ask my wife, if it's fun, she says no. So, <laughs> so it depends. And then we have these other hidden costs. We have, you know, insurance, taxes, interest, HOA fees, which if you are not in a snooty neighborhood, you do not have HOA fees. Just saying, but uh, most places seem to have those. So uh, let's talk through those. What, what does that look like? So for me, it wasn't even snooty places. It was that I can't afford a single family home. I could only afford a condo. And so like the, I think the cheapest place, the cheapest HOA I saw out of place was like around 375 a month. So most of them were around 500. Um, and so it was just like, man, like that, just completely changes the game like you think you're going to be spending this much but that's an added 500 and so if the um what is it the the taxes the property taxes the HOA the interest like all these things for me added up to like almost be what I would be paying in rent anyway and that's all so sort of, you could argue like throw away money. Like people say when you're renting, you're throwing away your money because it's not, you're not going to get it back, but you're also not getting your property taxes back. You're also, I mean, maybe you can write off some of it, but you're not getting your property taxes back. You're not getting that interest back. You're not getting the HOA stuff back. 
So all of that was still, I was going to be throwing away so much money. And this is um, for, again, my personal situation, like you were saying, Sean, like everyone has to evaluate this for themselves. If you're not going to pay an HOE fee, then then that could make a big difference. But for me, in my situation, in the area I'm in, like it was just ridiculous. And I could not afford to be in a single family home where I wouldn't be paying an HOA fee. All right. Yes. Condos have HOAs, you know, nice neighborhoods have HOAs, uh, you know, even some regular na- neighbors have HOAs. So I, I, that was definitely a question I, I always ask before I buy it. It's like, is there an HOA <laughs> that I don't want to live in an HOA area personally, but you might want to, and that's up to you, but you need to factor that in because that's not going to appear on your mortgage. And they're not even going to factor that in when they're qualifying you for a mortgage. But, you know, that $500 or even if it's $100, whatever it is, if that's, you know, part of how much you pay to live in the house, you need to consider that your total mortgage principal, interest, taxes, insurance is what people usually talk about. But also having HOA fees on top of that, that should be under the, it's, I, I recommend 20, 20 to 25% total of your, your pay. Uh, and that, I, I'd say take home pay should be what's going towards your, uh, your, your, uh, housing costs. So if you can't make that work with all of those things added on top of the principal, principal interest taxes, insurance, and HOA fees, that's something to really consider that if if that's pushing you over that amount into the 35, 40%, I I was qualified at 55% of my, my pay when I was buying my first home. That's absurd. That's, that should be criminal in my opinion. I didn't know better. And I was like, oh yeah, sure. You say I qualify. Terrible idea. Yeah, I was also qualified. I don't know. I didn't do the calculation of the percent, but it was well beyond what I felt I could comfortably afford. Yeah. So don't don't listen to what the pe- people who are being paid to sell you a bigger mortgage are telling you you qualify for. You need to do the math yourself for sure. And make sure you're including all of the fees and all of the, the interest and all the taxes and not just the principle and interest is what is which is what they usually will show you mm-hmm. okay and then once we've talked about all those things you're comparing that to the, the total rent cost why do you do that what does that mean how does that help you make a decision yeah so kind of going back to what i was saying before if i know that like all of those things added up are going to be um i'll just make up a number two thousand dollars like without even necessarily paying down the principal. Like all of this other stuff is going to be $2,000. And my rent um, is going to be $2,500. Sure, I'm going to be throwing away extra money, but um, maybe that's worth the piece. Like, like I think just knowing that I was going to be throwing away money in either situation. Um, and by the way, like it's not really throwing away money or you're, you're getting something out of spending this money. You are living in your home. Um, but that's what people always say. So I'm using that term, but I was just, I realized that I would be throwing away money in either situation In either situation, you're spending money to live there. And so I think it's just important for people to understand that it's not just in one or the other, like in, in both, you're going to be out some money. Um, and so comparing those costs, like with the HOA, with the property tax, with the interest, with the, this, how does that all added together compare to what the rentals are are going for in your area. Um, maybe it's a lot less. And then, you know, maybe buying, if you consider all the other factors, could be a good decision for you. Um, I think for a lot of teachers in the Bay Area, it's probably not the case. Yeah. I, I agree. It's very situation specific. And if you if anyone's wondering how to consider um or think about the maintenance costs as, as a function of, of what they're paying for their mortgage. Um, the way a landlord does it is they have whatever the rent is, and they usually do like five to 7% for uh, maintenance, and another five to 7% for capital expenditure, which are the big things like a roof. So if you're saying like 10 to 15% realistically, uh, being on top of what you are already paying, so say you have, you know, a thousand dollar mortgage that'd be 1150 that you need to make sure that you are comfortable with 
I would, I would even recommend putting aside that 150 every single month towards, you know, things that could come up. Uh, so that way you are ready for those. If, if that number, keeping that number in mind compared to your rent is also important, right? Because if it's like, well, I could rent, you know, I could have a mortgage for a thousand or rent for 1100. Well, now you're at 1150, you're spending more on your home. Uh, of course, as we talked about, there is that what they call forced savings of the principal pay down, uh, which you only get to take advantage of when you either cash out refinance or you sell, or there's fees for those things. Um, but just keeping in mind that that while there are advantages to owning a home, which I would love to talk about some other time, these are the things to consider when you're deciding whether or not you should rent. So we, we've been talking about the, the forced pay down just now, and you're talking about what you chose to invest your money instead. Now let's start transitioning towards that. People talk about buying a home as the best investment you'll make or the, the most important investment in your life and renting isn't that. What are your thoughts on that argument? Um, so I think that a house can certainly be an investment, um, but you're only going to end up having that money if you sell your house in the end. So if I stay in my house long term, it's all paid off. I feel great. Um, of course, now I don't have a house payment, right? Maybe 30, 30 years down the road, now I don't have a house payment. And so that's fantastic. But all the money that I have put into it is tied up in the house and I'm not going to have that money until I sell it. And actually, my dad was just in a situation where he sold his house um, in the Bay Area that my grandparents bought back in the 60s. Yes. So lucky, lucky them. Um sold it for a good amount of money and but it was like he didn't want to like they they loved the home it was the family home but the money he he's gonna need the money in retirement so you know now you're in the situation where you have to sell the home that you love to have the money that that's gone into it if you haven't been investing or saving separately um and so for me like I think that you can still invest wisely without having a home. So I um, it, I took all the money from my, what would have been my down payment. And I just used it to start like really heavily investing in my tax advantage account. So my Roth IRA, my 457B, my 403B. Um, and in, I think 2022, I was able to max out my 457B and my 403B, um, which was like, you know, I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it again, but I had this big chunk of money that was just sitting there in my high yield savings account, making little money because the interest rates were low at the time. Um, and, and I have invested it. And so now that money is growing for me and it's not growing in the housing market and instead it's growing in the stock market. And so it's still like, I think housing can be, or I shouldn't say housing, buying a house can be a great investment, but there are ways that you can still invest um, if you're not, if that if that's not the right choice for you. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree that owning a home, I think just to summarize just a few thoughts I have for, for owning a home. Owning a home is great if you, it's going to be cheaper for you. I mean, some places owning a home and versus renting is drastically better to own a home while in the Bay Area, not so much, right? Uh, you know, if you like the control you have over your own space, because you don't have as much control over what you do with a rental home. Um, and if, you know, just like where you can rent uh, versus where you can buy, uh, you, like the location is, is, is better for you to buy in an area you want to live in, while rent there is so much higher, but if you rent it at a, an affordable place, you'd be living in a place you don't want to go. So there's there's lots of different reasons to, to buy a home versus, uh, Renting home, and then also you get the benefits of you know your 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 pay down and appreciation and things like that if you're going to live there long term. There 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 are great reasons to buy a home, but that doesn't mean that you have to. Um, you know you don't even have to not be invested in real estate while you're renting. If you want to rent and then buy another house to rent and get you that's it that's in the housing market you're getting a lot of the benefits that you get from owning a home. Such as the the pay down of of the of the principal and, and the appreciation, but you're also getting you know payment from a a tenant 
to, to have that. So that's even more of an investment than owning your own home. So there's just a lot of ways that you can take advantage of uh, home ownership, whether you live there or whether you own it, if you want to have those benefits, uh, especially if renting is the better choice mathematically in this situation. Yeah, I definitely think that like if you live in a super high cost of living area, it's definitely something to look into if you've always been interested in buying a home to look into um, buying an, like a, a rental property elsewhere that is maybe a better uh, financial fit for you and that you can have a tenant living in that's helping you um, pay those monthly costs. Awesome. All right. Well, um, I think this has been a great conversation. I just want to wrap it up with a couple more questions that I ask all of my guests. Uh, my first question for you is what is your number one tip for teachers to have a richer wallet, classroom, and life? Um, I think like balance, finding balance, um, in, in all aspects of your life. So in the classroom, like, I think it can be so easy for teachers to get, uh, over consumed with our job, um, take work home. Like we're always planning, we're always grading, we're getting there early, we're staying late, we're working on the weekends. Um, and you don't have to do all that. Like you're a teacher and, and you're, you're doing a lot of good work. And so trying to find balance between your job and living your life outside of your job so that you can perhaps, um, do it more long-term because teachers get so burnt out, but also finding balance in, um, your, your finances. So like spending money on all of the things that you really enjoy and that really bring you joy. For me, I love traveling. Um, I love reading. Uh, so I'll buy books. I'll, I'll spend the money to go on a nice trip. Um, but I like don't do a lot of shopping. I, I cut back in the places that aren't serving me. So if you can, you can find that balance. I think you can really live the life you desire while still being able to reach um, goals, financial goals, personal goals, et cetera. Awesome. I mean, I, I harp on the balancing all the time. I don't want teachers to burn themselves out and leave the profession. I'm hoping that by teaching teachers finance, they'll be able to stay teachers longer and a lot of better teachers that stay teachers for sure. Um, what you brought up there, though, just reminded me of one more question I, I have. Um, and not to break with the ritual I have of ending with the last two questions, <laughs> but why why ritual finance? Um, ritual finance, because I... I was thinking when, when I first was starting it, I was like, what am I going to call this? And then one day, like the word ritual just popped into my head. Um, and I think like, right, we all have a morning ritual. Like we all have things we do all the time. And so those are our rituals, even though you might not think of it that way. And I thought, let's make our finances a ritual too. Like it doesn't have to be this scary thing that you're like afraid of dealing with. You can, you can set up systems and habits um, that maybe make it more enjoyable. And I thought ritual finance sounded more positive and perhaps less scary. Awesome. And if you think about it, it's rich, you will find Oh my God, I should change it. I should change the spelling of it. Uh, anyway, sorry. I, I, I'm all about puns all the time. Anyway, Thank you so much for coming on the show. That was a fantastic discussion. I love talking to you about this. Um, you know, I think we should get together some other time and have another great fun conversation. For sure. um, how can teachers that want to know more about what you do and, and learn from you get in contact with you? Um, the best way would be through my Instagram. So uh, Sean mentioned it earlier, but it's at ritual underscore finance. Um, my DMs are always open. I'm happy to chat on there and hear from you. See what you think. Yeah. Love to hear from people. I can attest that Brie is very responsive on her DMs. So, you know, go ahead and reach out to her, ask her any questions, get to know Brie, really connect there. Well, thank you so much, Brie, for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Are you worried you won't have enough money to retire? Or maybe you just don't know how you're going to get out of all of this debt. Whatever your situation is, I can help you. Go to teachermoneyshow.com slash guest and fill out the form there and you can come on the show for free coaching or we can meet one-on-one -on -one to discuss your needs. I look forward to talking to you.